discourse with your girl IJF where we embrace uncomfortable conversations and today is our first episode so happy new year and we have our first guest I'm going to have her introduce herself and tell you all what she does and a little bit about um you know who she is so go ahead okay cool um hello all my name is Characana Feliciano I am a genealogist um I also do have a sort of full-time separate job in the legal world. Um, I am a New York City native, now living in Jersey. Um, I've been doing genealogy now for about uh, (laughs) maybe like 15 years about. Um, And I'm currently the vice president of OGS, which is the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society, uh, the New Jersey chapter. Um, I'm one half of a podcast that focuses on genealogy with my co-host Janice. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's pretty much, that's me. That's my intro. Perfect. Thank you so much for, um, taking your Saturday to join me. Thank you for having me. Because having someone come into the city on a Saturday, we know is no easy work, but you made it, um, and you look marvelous. So we're going to jump right in because I've been like fiending for this for such a long time. (laughs) And it was an honor to find a black genealogist because I didn't even think they existed. But um, I started my work maybe like a month ago. And then I had like just bookmark all these like LinkedIn genealogists. And then I was like, wait a minute, let's go to the black ones if they exist. And then I found her and other groups of people. Um, So Uh, My first question for you is, how far back can you trace family lineage? Okay, so for uh, a lot of African Americans, um, we typically get what's called the 1870 brick wall. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it can get a little hard finding uh, our ancestors before that because 1870 is the first census that we're listed on and by name. Uh, Prior to that, um, if you are a descendant of the enslaved, um, your ancestors were not listed by by name they were part of like inventory um and they were chattel right so um but a lot of us are able to get past the 1870 brick wall um i know some folks in the genealogy the black genealogy space the african-american genealogy genealogy space who can go back to like the 17th century Mm -hmm. um me personally uh thanks to a recent civil war pension file that i was able to get of my ancestor um, I have him, you know, beyond 1870. So he um, says that he was around around by 1833. So he was born sometime a little bit before that. Um, so 1833? early 1833. Okay, yeah. I have so much. This is all the days <laughs> I'm bringing you more questions that I didn't have in mind. Um, but yes, okay, so you can go as far back as 1870, but with certain groups of people who are black American descendants of slaves, you can even go a little further than that. Yeah. Because I think about the 1619 Project, and right. um, that's a book about, you know, historical facts about black people, how they first got to Virginia, right. and all that stuff. But you're saying... odd folks. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. But you're saying that... Um, so that is, uh, there are some people actually who I have met who descend from that uh, colony. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that would be like a specific sort of lineage. Okay. Um, so yeah, like some folks have been fortunate enough to be able to document that. Mm-hmm. The issue too is also very state specific because a lot of this depends on how like the paperwork was done and how a census record was filed and how like that local government um, operated. So. For example, I know a lot of my Louisiana friends, uh, you know, black American genealogists from Louisiana who, who may or may not be Creole, typically have an advantage because the Spanish were known to take very good, like, notes and records. Okay, got it. Versus others, most of us are, you know, we descend from colonies that were, like, British or so forth. So mm-hmm. um, their records were not are not always as strong as, say, for example, like, Spain's or Louisiana and so forth. But So it, it, it depends. Wow, depends. okay, gotcha. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess my next question is um, for people who are because of who because I read like books like Toni Morrison mm-hmm. and they talk about like free colonies, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, people who after um, the Civil War, people who went on their own to do their own thing, mm-hmm. build their own black institution, black towns. Mm-hmm. Um, 
how do you know uh, which colony, what state, what uh, plantation the person mm-hmm, mm-hmm. comes from specifically? Isn't you know? Yeah, it's convoluted because you said the yeah. Spanish have more data on their property versus a French or English person. Yeah, so um, a lot of that is going to be, oral history is a really great starting point. You know, we always say start with the oldest relative. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's one way that you can kind of get some breadcrumbs. Okay, so like if your great-grandmother's alive, you should probably sit down with yeah, her. Yeah, and, and see what her. she says. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they'll say things that they don't realize is important, mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. know. Um, they have sometimes more information than they, they recognize. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big proponent of the Civil War pension file. And I, I do want to give a shout out to a genealogy friend, Bernice Bennett, who's been in the genealogy space for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she really kind of was a rallying call for the, the Civil War pension file. Mm-hmm. And then um, I had actually been looking for my, my ancestors. And the reason why it's important is because in the pension record, mm-hmm. you actually can get firsthand information from the ancestors. So this is someone who, this is a Civil War, right? Mm-hmm. So 1865. You know they were bef- they were alive and most likely enslaved, mm-hmm. and so there's going to be like interviews, affidavits, um, all kinds of information in there. So now, unfortunately for me, my ancestor never named. Well, that's not true. Mm-hmm. His his uh, his daughter from his first marriage does name one of the plantations. So mm-hmm. Sanders Plantation, I have that. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also know from the Civil War pension file that he was probably sold about four times, at least mm. four times. Okay, so he had four different marsters as he said or masters um so i know he wasn't just on the sanders plantation Mm -hmm. um i also know that at one point he was in louisiana on a plantation there so but some people luck out and they have a civil war plant uh, a civil war pension file and the Mm -hmm. plantation name is like listed right there maybe the slave owners listed right there or the enslaver as we say now is listed there so um i think that uh, again, I just Civil War pension file. So for you know any African Americans, Black Americans who are doing genealogy research and they want to get the names of those things, mm-hmm. I think Civil War pension files are a great resource for that. Gotcha. And what are some of the challenges that you run into as a genealogist? Because again, certain people are seen as property, unfortunately. Um, and then uh, I think about people who say stuff like, well, outside of the United States, Brazil is one of the biggest populations with African descendants. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the challenges that you kind of um, kind of run into? Um, with regards to like with regards to black American genealogy, like doing this, the research and stuff. Yeah, I kind of want to just focus on black Americans in particular. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> for one, it's the, the vast size of the United States. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you have an ancestor who might have been maybe brought into the port in Charleston, South Carolina, Mm -hmm. but then later on sold to a completely different state, like, you know, maybe Louisiana. Then from there sold to, you know, another state, maybe maybe close to like Alabama or Mississippi, or it could have been further away, back Mm -hmm. up to like North Carolina or something like that. So the vast size of the country can present a challenge because that's a lot of paperwork traveling back and forth and Mm -hmm. exchanging of hands and things can get lost in the mix. Um, you know, names, there's a lot of, you know, uh, for example, I have one uh, last name, Sproul, I'll just say that, or even like the Becton last name. Mm-hmm. You can have a whole area and like everybody's a Sproul. Okay. And it becomes, and then I have an ancestor, John Henry <clears throat> Sproul. You know how many John Henry Sprouls were living in North Carolina at the time? There's so many. Okay. So naming gets all a there. little, yeah, naming can get a little bit r- complicated in terms of ha- trying to narrow down, you know, who your ancestor actually is. Um, and so once you, um, if you don't have a parent, right. and because John Henry, I don't have a Civil War pension file, for example, for him, I, I really can't get past him right now. So I have to find out other creative ways um, around that, other kind of breadcrumbs and clues. Um, some clues are le- leading me to Canada. Okay, okay, yeah, I was, was going to ask about <laughs> yeah. that. Well, not even Canada, but I think about, like, the Haitian Revolution mm-hmm. and how they're the first black public to yeah. free themselves in the Western Hemisphere and yeah. how a lot of people say, like, Louisiana, right, Creole. Mm-hmm. They said mm-hmm. sometimes the words or even certain foods come from Haitian people. So mm-hmm. does that get convoluting? We have to deal with Caribbean people who came up or black Americans who went down to Haiti after they were free. Is that even true? Like... 
Well, for I think someone who has like the Creole ancestry could probably speak more to that. Okay, gotcha. Um, I mean, I know there was an established like Creole community there, um, mm-hmm. you know, prior to uh, Haitian migration, you know, from the Haitian Revolution. Mm-hmm. So there was already an established community there. Uh, my understanding is that there was like a back and forth, like there were Haitians who moved there, mm-hmm. some were black Haitians, some were white Haitians. Um, mm-hmm. And then there were, you know, black American uh, Creoles mm-hmm, mm-hmm. who went to Haiti. So, mm-hmm. you know, it was a back and forth. And I think, you know, whenever you have a shared colonizer, mm-hmm. there's always that um, pattern in, in migration and, tra- you know, there's going to be that commonality. And so people are going to travel gotcha. to those places. Um, but they, you know, they're kind of like a, a I don't want to say a subculture, but they're, it's like its own unique history there. Gotcha. Um, so I do have like one, a friend of mine, um, Rodney Sam, shout out to him. He's a, a he has Creole ancestry. He does a lot of Creole work. Um, mm-hmm. Creole Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, he does a lot of genealogy. Jerry Simeon mm-hmm. from uh, Louisiana. Um, so those folks are, you know, really they could speak more to like the Creole um, ancestry and things like that. Gotcha. Um, now this is a, another question that I have for you. You know how they say the blood quantum rule, where you have like a lot of people who are like European descendants who claim to be like Cherokee or yeah. Blackfoot or other native groups. Yeah. So they can cut into certain casino money or just money in general. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about black people saying the same stuff? Like, you know, they're Indian or native. Yes. What are your thoughts on that as a genealogist? And okay. what have you seen? Okay, so what I have seen is. Because we want to debunk certain things right, and also right. set certain things straight, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I do know that, for example, actually my co-host on my podcast, you know, she has confirmed like Native ancestry. So there are folks who can actually follow the paper trail. They see it there um, and they they have that ancestry there. Mm -hmm. For a lot of people, I mean, myself included, Mm -hmm. um, one of the lines was always like, I have Cherokee in the family Mm -hmm. and I haven't been able to like prove that. Mm -hmm. And so what typically is the case is it seems like it's a biracial ancestor okay. who, you know... Because I was going to say, how did they come into contact with one another? Like a native and an African? I mean, I read oh, well, a, yeah, mm-hmm. it would definitely, like, there were, you know, um, I don't know if it would have been called reservations at the time, but, mm-hmm. you know, there were different indigenous tribes nearby, mm-hmm. you know, who lived locally. Mm-hmm. Um, so there may have been a cultural exchange there. Okay. Um, then sometimes the, you know, they were a so, place of refuge sometimes. Just to be clear, when Africans did make their way to the United States, mm-hmm. there were still native groups who weren't completely gone. And right. they still were around. For sure. But there were paperwork that probably um, maybe like board, had like borders for them to step in and step out of, if that makes sense. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a good way of putting it. Okay. Um, you know, I, and as well as some, I think one of the reasons why the Cherokee get brought up a lot is because mm-hmm. Cherokee were also slave owners. Oh, so, okay. so when you say slave, they own their own indigenous group, so they also had Africans. No, they had black slaves. So How the Trail of Tears happen? was that, you know, they brought their... And, be, well, and also, too, Cherokee's kind of a broad, has become like a broad term. Okay. You know, and again, I don't want to like overstep. That's not necessarily my area of expertise. Right, right, right. right, right, but, right, right, right. Um, you know, it was just a part of assimilating to European culture that was being, you know, imposed upon them or, you know, they found an opportunity to make money, whatever the case may be. Mm. But um, they were enslavers. And I do think that's part of how they became introduced into a lot of black American um, genealogy stories that mm-hmm. so-and-so has, was half Cherokee. And gotcha. 90% of the time, it's a woman. It's like a, a female Cherokee, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who's like some daughter of a chief. Mm-hmm. And that's all, that's the two p- typical story. Okay. So, so it's like a, Pocahontas. Uh, somewhat, somewhat. So it's a mixture of, there's a lot of mixture of fact, a mixture of fact and fiction, right? Mm-hmm. So there may have been an actual exchange with them. Mm -hmm. They could have been in proximity. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of times it could be a biracial ancestor Mm -hmm. and to explain away the different phenotype, either that ancestor or their descendant maybe creates the storyline of like, oh, well, so-and-so was, you know, Indian, as they would say back in the day. Gotcha. Um, So, yeah. Okay, because for me growing up in Brooklyn, in New York, I've heard a lot of people they say that they're Indian or native. I don't want to say Indian, so I'm just saying native. I'm going right. to say indigenous. Yeah, yeah. Um, or uh, sometimes Spanish, whatever the case mm-hmm, that means. Mm-hmm. So for me, whenever I heard like black people who said that, who look just like me, I'm like, is this a way for you to just not claim blackness? Are you ashamed of the black Listen, history it could that you be. have? It could be. It okay. could be. You know, I'm not discounting that that's part of it. Right. I think it is 
you know, anti-blackness could certainly be a proponent of it. Mm -hmm. um, I do think because indigenous culture was more like tangible mm -hmm. and like, you know, it's like there mm -hmm. or in, and we're here mm -hmm. versus like African culture is like over there for mm -hmm. a lot of us. It's a memory, it's a distant memory. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was just probably for some people easier to relate to. Okay. Um, that's a possibility as well. Um, I mean, it's funny because I did end up finding some, like I do have native ancestry, but that's from a different line. Mm -hmm. And then the line that claimed Cherokee, it is like this 1% is really small, but it's mm -hmm. like Mexico, which okay. has another, <laughs> you know, so it just becomes like, how does Mex and then Mexico and then that line is from North Carolina. So that becomes a whole story as to how that happened. So right. because there's a, it's a bit, it's breadcrumbing, right? There's a bit of truth mm -hmm. and there's some fiction and you have to, you know, pull it out. Bread, yeah. yeah. Um, now, my next question is, we always like to think that all white people had slaves mm -hmm. and stuff like that, mm -hmm. but come to find out certain groups of Europeans were bounty hunters, so they didn't mm -hmm. have the power or the right. money or the collateral to even own a human being. Mm -hmm. So um, what are your thoughts on people who still give like all white people credit for owning slaves? Not, mm -hmm. not trying to like say that there's no privilege that comes with you know European right. descendants, whether you're Italian, Polish, whatever, right. but what can you kind of like shed light on? Like how many people in America actually were merchants? Uh, what's the percentage of slave owners? You know, a lot of that will vary too. And it varies by the years and okay. it varies again by the state. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not like a big, I don't, I'm not a scholar on that. I think um, someone who comes to mind is Warren Miltaire. Mm -hmm. um, he did a lot of great work on free people of color. Okay. Um, but, you know, even to the extent where not every you know white person owns slaves, I think you know a lot of people recognize that. Um, they all benefited from it um, because it was a strong source of you know economic strength mm -hmm. for these states, and that's what sustained them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's enough for us to have a civil war over the issue, because it wasn't states' rights; it was the state's right to you know practice slavery. Okay. So for us to have a whole civil war over that, you know, that it, you know, that I think speaks to the impact of slavery and you know what it meant for the economy for this country. Um, again, you have a, a state like South Carolina, which would have been a port of mm -hmm. entry, right? So like mm -hmm. Charleston, um, you're going to have a lot more um, white folks who probably were enslaved, you know, mm -hmm. slave owners mm -hmm. uh, and descend from slave owners, versus maybe a state, maybe you know, out in Minnesota or somewhere um, where you may not have like the same amount. Um, so oh, okay. it, you know it depends. It's all it's geography. It's very much geography related, related, and it peaks and there's peaks and value in valleys mm -hmm. um, in the amount of slaves and slave owners. Mm -hmm. uh, depends on the economy. People start sl selling their assets and selling their slaves. Right. That you know lowers the amount of uh, slave owners in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, folks move around. A lot of times you have states where there's a higher slave population there than a white population. Oh. But they're okay. all, you know, enslaved, but, you know, the slave owners are in a different state. So there's a lot of, like, moving pieces to okay, this. Okay, wait, wait, so explain that again. So, uh, for example, let's just say, like, a city in South Carolina. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is Charleston in South Carolina? Yeah, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. so, okay so let's say Charleston, right? Let's just say, for example, that was the situation where there was more black people than the white people. But you right. said they lived in different states. So is that yeah. the borders that were drawn? So they would live in different... A lot of Sometimes it could be something as simple as weather. You know, they just mm -hmm. didn't like the weather there. Um, for I have, for example... One of my lines, like the Chitty line, mm -hmm. um, they're out of South Carolina. Um, but, you know, we, we've been trying to kind of trace where the enslaver went. Mm -hmm. And we've also been trying to, like, confirm and nail down paternity. But it seems like that line, even though the enslaved were in South Carolina, mm -hmm. the enslavers, mm -hmm. the slave families, were not necessarily there. So okay. they may have been, a lot of them went to Alabama. Okay. So, um, and I, I did see a few sprinkling in Texas. So stuff like that happened. Okay. Um, you had a lot of people summering in different states, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so there was slavery, for example, in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, you can see winter time comes. They're not trying to stay in Jersey. You know, they might go south, you know, and, and summer somewhere, you know, ha where it's warmer. So it's like being like a, a snowbird. They would take their properties with them to a different state. Right. 
Um, well, the, or sometimes the property would stay like you know in, in the, the winter, in the, right? And they would just do as they were told by like a. Well, that I don't like. I, I don't know the specifics of that. I just know okay. that a lot of slave owners didn't always stay in a state where their you know property was at. But that's where overseers come in, right? And gotcha. that's what, you know, kind of, I don't want to say a property manager, but in a way, sort Oof. of like that. Yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So, I know this is a lot going on right now in my <laughs> brain. <laughs> it's like you're opening different pockets that I didn't even think of. So, my next question is, like, what is some of the craziest stories that you've come across? Or have you ever gotten to like prove somebody who's black, I should say black like me, or mm -hmm. even darker, mm -hmm. to have like maybe like a Tom Jefferson like ancestry, like you can prove oh, it so yeah. you can get some money or like, you oh, know. Oh, to prove to get them. Get some, some money, money or some land or some type of something like you know like some scammers i haven't seen some scammers. i haven't met some scammers you know i no, not I, scammers like <laughs> if i say i'm a descendant of a jefferson like a george washington like what if i if i could prove that right, right. is there any type of like lineage or money that's set out for his family in particular that i can be like I got my papers, y'all, <laughs> or it don't work that way no it doesn't really work that way um okay. you know at this point too you're talking about folks from way, you know, way back in terms of like the money, like, you know, where, how much of the money is left at this know, point? Right? And mm -hmm. like, it's, it's, their, their heirs have been identified and it's been divvied up or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you really wanted to, I guess there's nothing stopping someone from saying that, like, you know, hey, I am a so and such and such generation removed, and <laughs> I want my, you know, I want my cut. I want my two quarters. If, I guess if mm -hmm. you want to, uh, you know, you look at the laws of that state, right. see if you have a claim, and you know, go for it. Oh, but, okay. um, you know, I haven't seen anybody do that. Um, what what I do see, for example, is like, you know, we do have like lineage societies, like people uh -huh. might find they have a descendant from the, uh, they descend from a, uh, someone who fought in the American Revolution, gotcha. you know, so there oh. are black people, you know, who may not have visible European ancestry, who, who do have European ancestors right. and are members of, you know, for example, Daughters of the American Revolution. So I do know a lot of folks there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do you feel about the whole one drop rule as mm -hmm. a genealogist? Like... Right, so because in my culture, yeah, because in African culture, at least I was going to speak for certain West African cultures that mm -hmm. we know, there's no such thing as a one drop rule. Mm -hmm. Even when someone is mixed, we don't consider them black. They're right. Just, sometimes they use like even like uh, words like half casted or half bred. Yeah. They I, don't... I've been to Ghana. I was uh, someone told me about being called half cast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, it's not a word. It's like kind of like mulatto. It's like a yeah. bad. I mean, yeah. the Africans that I know who use it, they don't say that. I don't know how it's to not put a term it. of endearment. It's not a term of endearment, but it's just like a way of no, they're just not us. You know, they right. they have a parent who's not black, so they wouldn't yeah. be considered black. So yeah, yeah what are your thoughts on uh, the so, whole one drop rule? So the one drop rule, um, also again, this goes back to state. Mm -hmm. um, so every state has a census, and you know, you that's where you sort of see mulatto race, right? Mulatto, black, white, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. Uh, every state had its own way of categorizing things. The one drop rule is actually kind of new in the United States. I know a lot of black Americans get this rap of accepting the one drop rule, but it mm -hmm. wasn't always uh, the rule, actually. Okay. Um, and you can see that in a census record because there was a category for in mulatto, mm -hmm. um, which is a derogatory term, but it it is what it is. That mm -hmm. was the, the phrasing for it. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously there was a recognition of someone being mixed race. Mm -hmm. Um, over time, um, I cannot remember the name of the gentleman, um, but my understanding is Mulatto's sons okay. were a th became a threat because they could potentially own land now because they are the son of a white enslaver. Right. And so now they're taken into the cut of the fully white sons. Right. So eventually it was like, okay, we're not going to have all that. You're just, you're black. Gotcha. So <clears throat> that is one of the reasons why the one drop rule came about. Mm -hmm. um, also, too, in America, it's just... Oh, so it was a way to basically say like, hands off of my money. It, there was an economic component to right. the reason, okay. for sure. Okay, okay. Um, I also, too, I mean, like, being mixed race in America, especially at the time of slavery and mm -hmm. Jim Crow, you know, it, it may or may not protect you. Um, mm -hmm. It does not, you know, it, you could very well get like what they call the nigga wake up call. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so I think for those who are passing, you know, 
now for people who are passing yeah um well that's different right because you know it's like if you're passing you get to like jump back and forth with being white and then you want to come to the well cookout. if you're passing you're passing there's right. no there, it's dangerous to go back and forth mm-hmm. there's actually a story about um his name was anatole boyard he was a uh, journalist for the new york times mm-hmm. and he was from louisiana he passed mm-hmm. and his daughter didn't find out that he was actually, you know, black or Creole mm-hmm. from Louisiana until after he died. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when he, when you passed, you you passed. Right. There was no going back and forth. It was dangerous mm-hmm. because uh, if white people found out, you know, that was a wrap. And mm-hmm. um, a friend of mine was actually just telling me about a book she was reading about the lives of people who passed. And it mm-hmm. was not, you know, it was a lot of misery associated with it, it was a lot of suicide. People mm. chose not to have children because, you know, they were afraid of what the children could look like. Um, you know, there you don't, yeah, you don't go back and forth. It was a decision you made and, you know, you, you cut ties. Um, now that it, some, it's, it's a gamble, right? Some mm-hmm. people, it may have worked out for them and they, you know, like Anatole Broyard, he was able to have the career he did mm-hmm. likely because, you know, um, you know, to an detectable. extent he was, right. Mm-hmm. Um, not taken away from his talent, but, you know, certainly, um, people thinking he was white was helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, and then for other people, it may not have worked out so well. Yeah. I didn't know there was a high suicide rate amongst some of them. I don't know the rates, but I just know that like, it was part of the experience. Like, you know, you can imagine it could be isolating, you know, it could be lonely. Oh, um, because you're not, uh, you're, you're cutting yourself off from a completely, you know, a whole side of your family, sometimes a whole family. So how do you verify like um, accurate information when you actually do all this digging? Okay, so there's something called the genealogical proof standard, mm-hmm. um, and so it would be exhaustive research, mm-hmm. um, accurate citations. Citations are key. Um, you want to. Um, you have to kind of test out or was it suss out conflicting information. Mm-hmm. Um, and then well, let me look at my list here before you. Analysis and correlation of the collected information, resolving the conflicting ev- evidence, and then you have your conclusion. Okay. So um, basically, so one of the things I do with citations, mm-hmm. um, what I like to do is I, I like to have a research log. Mm-hmm. So whenever I'm doing like research on whether it's myself or like a client or a friend or whatever, I want to um, put down, you know, okay, what, what am I looking for? Mm-hmm. Where did I go for that information? Uh, what did I find there? Mm-hmm. And then have an accurate uh, citation for it, you know, and then date it so that, you know, I know when it happened. So that helps me keep in, you know, keep it organized. Right. Um, I know where I got the information so I can go back and, um, you know, verify it and also sh- share it as proof to the, the person that I'm giving the information to. Mm-hmm. And then you don't duplicate, um, you know, efforts. Okay. So that's also important because a lot of times you, you look at a census record three, four, and five, six times. It's like there's no need to do that. Like you, you, you looked at the census record already. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, And then with that conclusion also helps. Like I did that for a friend of basically, you know, typing up, okay, this is based off of the information that I found. Right. Um, this is uh, what we can conclude. So, for example, it could be, we can conclude that um, such and such ancestor was living in this state prior to, you know, 1915, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, we can, or it could be something like, because we like to have a specific question. Because if you if you come into research open ended, like I'll oh, just find my ancestor, like you're gonna be there forever. Mm-hmm. Something good is like, okay, can you tell me the name of? Can we find the name of such and such parent? Right. That's like a nice, you know, it's a clean answer, a, a question, and give you a clean answer, and then you take the analysis from there, and you can conclude at the end, based of the analysis, based off of the analysis, these were such and such parents. Right. Um, and then something with conflicting evidence could be like, well, I found your ancestor named John Henry Smith, mm-hmm. and then this other person named John Henry Smith. They were born around the same time, mm-hmm. and I can conclude though that. You know, this this John Henry Smith is your person mm-hmm. versus this John Henry Smith mm-hmm. is not your person because of X, Y, and Z reasons, gotcha. right? So that's where the conflict, you know, uh, reconciling conflicting information comes from. Right. Um, and if anyone's ever fa- watched Finding Your Roots, they always oh, put that disclaimer out say there. That. Mm-hmm. They say, you know, um, the information is, it, it could be subject to change, right? Mm-hmm. As new information comes out, you know, and maybe as new evidence comes out, um, you may have to reevaluate some stuff because. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a living kind of breathing experience in a way. Um, 
But for example, we just had the 1950 census that just came out. So right. census records are, um, they're shared every 72 years. They're made pub public. Mm -hmm. So up until uh, 2022, we were working with the 1940 census. That was the latest census we had. Mm -hmm. So the 1950 census hits. Now you have new information. So right. to whatever extent you need to maybe update something or go back and verify something, you can do that. Maybe right. you might find, oh, such and such was not living in New York in 1950. You know what I mean? Right. They lived somewhere else in 1950. So, um, you know, you always want to, it's not always clean cut answers. I was going to say, yeah. Right. I'm pretty sure it, it gets very messy and you, right. well, that's where you come in to do all the cleaning. Kind of. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I had someone who was, uh, you know, I, I love having conversations about genealogy research and stuff like that. And she mm -hmm. wanted to kind of like go back and forth, and, and which I don't mind. You mean going back and forth, like trying to question you? No, no, oh. just kind of have a conversation about, um, you know, genealogy and mm -hmm. her family research. Mm -hmm. But after a while, when it comes to like, you know, to what extent I can be helpful and right. of service, like I kind of, I need you to narrow down a question. Because <laughs> um. I'm going to be here forever. True, 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 true. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, so. So pick a family, pick a side. Maybe pick a side. Okay. Yeah, exactly. And then. <laughs> You take it from there that's the the, the best way and it, mm -hmm. that's also probably the easiest way to be in line with those genealogical um standards you know proof standards yeah because i can imagine it gets very convoluting you know yeah oh yeah yeah oh yeah yeah you need to get, get paid the big bucks because that's, <laughs> that's a lot of work <laughs> Ooh, put that out there and you know yes. the big buck to hear <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, let's receive that. right 2024 <laughs> that's what we're bringing in um then i guess my last question, mm -hmm. I don't want to keep you for so, too long, is what are your thoughts on Ancestry.com? <laughs> I actually like Ancestry.com. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, Ancestry's been very helpful. Um, people yeah. say it's a scam. I don't know why. Because they, they say they always say, that, say it, that they always say that people only come from one part of West Africa, when in reality, there's multiple countries in West Africa, and then no, certain groups of people come from... Yeah, it breaks it down. Mm -hmm. Like, my, my DNA has... So when it first... You get updates, right? So mm -hmm. it'll change, and as more people test, mm -hmm. their database expands. Mm -hmm. And so as more Africans test, mm -hmm. it'll help expand the database as well. Mm -hmm. It'll kind of pick up more on the nuances. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you take it with a grain of salt, but it mm -hmm. hasn't been, like, so off. It's not like I took a DNA test from Ancestry and I came back, you know, a race that I was like, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it made sense, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, the numbers mm -hmm. made sense, so... Um, so, you know, my breakdown at first, it was, I think Cameroon was like the highest one. Mm -hmm. And then after a couple updates, like Nigeria has come up for a lot of people. And mm -hmm. I think as more Nigerians are testing and things like that, mm -hmm. where it gets tricky is obviously because the borders in Africa have changed, mm -hmm. right? So the idea of Ni they weren't Nigeria even, yeah. now is not Nigeria back before. Then. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So. It doesn't necessarily break you down, break it down by like ethnic group, right? Okay, right. So that's why people was like, because there's a lot of Africans who are like online who say that it's a bunch of bull crap. They're like, those people are not us. We are a, not them. Um, and then like the border stuff, because mm -hmm. before uh, you know the Belgium conference, every group was mm -hmm. their ethnic land. You know, right, like right. people come from the Mandan or the Wolof people. Right, they, they had their own kingdoms. They weren't like a border. Right, so. right, right, right. I mean, I think. You have to look at DNA as a tool, right? Mm -hmm. It's a starting point. Okay, so you would say if you do want to figure out who you are, Ancestry.com wouldn't be a bad start. Or is there, no, like, no. genealogists that you can uh, specifically go to if you don't want to go to Ancestry.com? Like you, do you, like, do a service where you help people out who... I mean, you can always hit me up. I love helping people, like, okay. try to break brick walls. Mm -hmm. You know, for black Americans, there's a... Who we are, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. we, we descend from American chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. That means we descend from African, indigenous, some of us, mm -hmm. and European. Mm -hmm. it, it is what it is. like, And so the the European varies. Sometimes it's, uh, the U, you know, England, and sometimes it's Ireland, sometimes it's Scotland. Mm -hmm. The African varies. Sometimes it's, you know, more Guinea. It could be, it could be Cameroon. Mm -hmm. It could be Ghana for some people. Like, mm -hmm. you, you know, so... You don't look at DNA as a um, the end all be all. Okay. You know, but it is a tool. So if if for example it's coming up as Nigeria, mm -hmm. all right, it's a great opportunity to start maybe doing a little research. You mm -hmm. want to know like okay, maybe whereabouts in Nigeria, mm -hmm. what particular tribes had the highest export of slaves. Like mm -hmm. that's just a starting point. Mm -hmm. Now what you can do is 
as more Africans, continental Africans start um, testing, testing mm -hmm. you might get some matches. That's starting to happen. Mm, okay. And, you know, so people, I have met black Americans who have met, you know, were connected with a, a you know, 10th cousin oh, who wow. is, you know, from Africa. And that can start that dialogue as to how that's, so, so it, it is a, for that connection to happen, it has to go both ways. It, it's okay. not just on like black Americans do DNA of tests course. and then the answers come. Like uh, Africans, if, if they test, mm -hmm. you know, you might start seeing like matches and things like that. Gotcha. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much for yeah. joining me. Hopefully, I didn't get too rowdy, or um, hopefully, these no. are not too controversial. <laughs> but, you know, it is called awkward discourse. It's going to get a little uncomfortable. But, um, <laughs> One more time, where they can find you, contact you. Um. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I am on, you can find me on Instagram, uh, curious.conjurer. Um, that's sort of like my genealogy buzz name, if you will. <laughs> uh, I've got a YouTube channel I'm trying to start now, Chericana uh, Podcast, Janice and Chericana, uh, Genealogy Conversations with Janice and Chericana, um, and pretty much uh, Facebook. Um, and you can certainly, I guess, email me. I'll, I can, I'll give you the email address. You can, Drop it somewhere. Yeah, like I'll put it in the video below. But yeah. I also found her on LinkedIn. I went the professional Hello. route. So, yeah. <laughs> come, come correct if you, you know, do yeah. want to get in touch with her. Because uh, this was just like a small synopsis of what she does. And um, yeah. I do really appreciate what you've just given me. Because, again, Thank I didn't you. even know you people exist. I'm like genie out. We're out here, man. I know. Because you said that you were part of like a chapter in New yeah. Jersey. I'm yeah. just like, so there's multiple chapters. It's a national organization. And there's a chapter here in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a chapter here in and there's a chapter in Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, conferences. Uh, yeah, we do have okay. conferences. Uh, members are of Caribbean descent, mm -hmm. um, Black Americans, so like Southern, you know, background and stuff like that. So it's a great opportunity, and we're not the only ones. Um, Asla, Salsa, Asla, A S A L H, I think is the name. Um, but you know, there's a lot of Black American genealogists okay. out here. Perfect. Um, thank you again. Thank you. And this was fun. Um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>